It's Lonely Out There for a Human, Elliot Schaefer, on how literature for young people can bond us with the natural world. October 19, 2021, 80th Annual Book Week, College of Education and Human Development, University of Minnesota, Driven to Discover. So it's kind of easy to forget that we are really apes, storytelling apes, wearing clothes. So it's been under the radar for many children's literature authors, except not for Eliot. Uh, his books show that we must start thinking about animals differently, that preserving biodiversity and wildlife are not optional, but essential to supporting the web of life that young people today have a right to inherit. Eliot's work helps young people appreciate their biospheric legacy. It inspires. It is critical for raising a generation of climate conscious citizens mindful if of inalienable rights of the non-human world. And Elliot's work has been named the best of the best by several organizations, including NPR, ALA, and the Chicago Public Library. It has won a number of prestigious awards, including the Green Earth Book Award and Sigurd Olson Nature Writing Award. But to truly appreciate what Elliot has achieved, you need to look into his work. And when you read his work, what you find is a world-building jaguar or lion. He's a master wordsmith whose stories empower and transform lives. And this is a magic that defies easy explanation, magic that is more powerful than all of the awards combined, and magic that nourishes our own animal souls. So this is the voice of Elliot Schrafer and the power behind his writing. Friends, please help me welcome the weaver of awesomeness, Elliot Schrafer. Yeah, awesome, dude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Merrick. You, you've been an amazing host, and we actually got to do a roundtable yesterday talking about climate literature, and it was so fascinating that what you had to say that I'm looking forward to our Q&A portion where we can continue the conversation there. Thank you. Um, weaver of awesomeness, I mean, that's great. Thank you, I'm gonna keep that with me. I might get it tattooed somewhere on my body. Um, since I'm far enough away from you, I'm gonna take off my, my mask. Hello to everyone at home uh, watching on Zoom. Hi, mom. Uh, um, I, uh, I can't wait to talk to you all today a little bit about sort of my philosophy around how books for young people can help young people develop what they already have, which is an affinity for the natural world and for, and for animals. Uh, so I'm gonna take you a little bit on a journey uh, of my own uh, as a, from a young person uh, to becoming a, a writer. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q and A's. So if you have any questions that come up as I'm, as I'm speaking to you, um, I would uh, be happy to answer. So I'm gonna start with me at 13. And I actually looked through my photo album to find a picture of me at 13. And I think I might have been 15, but I was a small 15-year-old, so this is like more, I was about the size of a 13-year-old. And I was so proud of that hair. Like, you don't realize until looking back the eras when you were, had a haircut you shouldn't have had. Like, I would spend a long time in the morning like gelling it down with my depth gel and it would be behind my ears. And then like midway through the school day, I'd muss it up a little bit. And anyway, it was, it was a bad move on my part, but that is me at 13. And when I was in my early teens, I actually felt pretty low a lot of the time. Um, every day-to-day -day interaction felt a little bit meaningless. My mind kept spinning to the big questions. Why are we here? Is it wrong to seek your own happiness when there's so much suffering in the world? Isn't everything we do kind of arbitrary, but it's like everyone's agreed never to acknowledge that fact, so it's sort of like we're all going around lying to yourself. Some of us still have these questions, but they're especially loud when you're 13. And because my brain kept skittering away to these huge questions, all the daily things, like taking a math test, going to a football game, celebrating someone's birthday, they all seemed sort of meaningless. The storm in my brain couldn't quiet down long enough that I could be a real human like everyone else seemed to manage to do. If I'd believed in a god, I might have become a hardcore believer, but I just didn't, so that wasn't an option. So instead I tried to find meaning everywhere else. I memorized, actually memorized, all the rules for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons after my parents bought me a set of the rule, back, rule books from a garage sale, even though I actually never found anyone who wanted to play with me. And 
I realized like it's, it's like one level of dorky to have memorized it and then another level entirely, like no one actually wanted to play with me afterwards. Um, and I don't know how to explain it, but there was something really comforting about knowing how many hit dice a displacer beast had or all the spells available to a cleric in the fifth level. And, um, they gave, I realize now what I was looking for was structure in the world. And those books gave me structure and order and I was desperate for it. I was desperate for reasons for why things existed. And as a grade A nerd, which can hardly be news to you at this point, um, whenever I was in a sort of emotional hard period, I would drag myself to the library and wander the shelves, uh, waiting for one of the book spines to call out to me and say like, here I am, young Elliot, read me for all the answers you seek. And I was in the nonfiction section one day when I spied this beautiful coffee table book called Thread of Life. And I pulled it off the shelf and I figured I'd distract myself for a few minutes by looking at some cool animal photographs and they were cool, but it was the text that pulled me in. And I sat where I was and I read that book, cover to cover, right there on the library's industrial carpeting. When I finished, I smiled for the first time that day. I'd found order, meaning, and purpose, even though I still believed I lived in a universe without a creator, or even any cool demigods and dragons. The topic of the book is evolution, and how the breathtaking beauty of the natural world came to be through adaptation by natural selection. I hadn't realized that science could give answers in quite that way. I'd assumed scientists' job was to observe interesting things and to raise important questions, but they couldn't produce any sort of meaning that could give direction to a person's life. But I was wrong. Evolution actually explains why life came to be in the form that it's in and what purpose organisms have. Teenage me was one of those things that came to be, so evolution actually told me what purpose I had. It was like, boom, it was a major moment. Um, this is a really goofy looking giraffe and I just kind of fell in love with it, so that's why I chose it. Uh, <laughs> evolution does nothing less than explain the origins of all of life. And over time, a giraffe that happened to be born with a slightly longer neck found that it could reach higher leaves, and so it survived to produce offspring that also had slightly longer necks. And a few of those that happened to be taller than their parents could also reach leaves that were even higher, and so they thrived over their siblings, passing even longer necks down the line. Over time, the giraffe changed. They are gorgeously suited to their time in the world. The giraffe's neck came to be for a reason. So did their nose shape, their coloration, the wonder of their eyes and their kidneys, the mineral composition of their hoofs and teeth. If you go back billions of years earlier, single-celled organisms started to cooperate and join together, forming the first multicellular creature, the giraffe's really early ancestor, and ours too. There exists a perfectly logical and compelling explanation for most anything about an organism. The marvelous diversity of life doesn't have to be the work of some magical intelligence. It can result from a force called natural selection that is as essential to the history of life as gravity is to physics. So my belief that everything was arbitrary and meaningless and empty had left me lonely and unhappy as a teenager, but reading about animals got me out of that hole. It's a little overdramatic to say it saved my life, but it got me halfway there. For example, I thought it was incredibly stupid to go to a football game and cheer for our side when the other team was made up of humans just like us, with their own hopes and worries. Why did we deserve to win any more than they did? Reading the evolutionary history of primates taught me how essential in-group, out-group thinking is to our hard wiring. Our tendency to turn enemies, uh, strangers into enemies has everything to do with our millions of years spent competing with rivals for scarce resources. The apes who hated identical apes on the other side of the hill were the ones that chased those enemies away or killed them and survived longer and passed more of their genes to early humans. Sports reenact that history only symbolically this time around. Good luck bringing up the primate history of sports, by the way, when people are watching the game, like they do not want to hear it while they're scarfing their nachos. Um, but there's no undoing this ingrained emotional appeal of creating others and then fighting them. Uh, and so knowing this, that we're now like symbolically doing it in sports, I could actually cheer our team with a little more passion because doing so isn't arbitrary and meaningless. You're fulfilling the destiny written into your primate brain long before you were born. An awareness of this part of our biology, our tendency to create an adversary so that we succeed more, allows you to act more kindly and empathetically, to work against it uh, when the, the situation calls for it. So this is all a way of saying as background, there's a very good reason that you are who you are. It's not just random. And how wonderful it is to be linked to the giant web of life that way. So the question of my writing career has been, how can you make, how can I make young people know 
that relief to. Know that they are linked and bonded by something far larger than just human culture. Here's um, one of the answers I came across sort of by accident, and I'll tell you how I came to write about the apes, but this is me and one of the um, young apes I met at the sanctuary in Congo. <laughs> Codoro, c'est pas un arbre après tout. Allez, descends. Descends. Any of you who have been to like a toddler's birthday party anytime recently will like recognize all of this amazingly well. It is, it is an animal that shares 98.7% of its DNA with us. These are the bonobos, um, which are pretty much tied with chimpanzees as our closest relatives. And when I found out about them, you know, I had not been writing books about conservation and animals. Um, but I found out about this species of creature uh, and that idea that we had something that was so closely related to us, that was so near to us, became a real inspiration. Because when scientists wanted to look at a creature that seemed like our closest animal relative, they looked at the chimpanzees for the longest time. And chimpanzees are really highly related to us, but they're also really violent. So there's chimpanzees will murder each other. They are a very patriarchal society, so the female chimpanzees are, by our human standards, abused by the males. They will practice infanticide, so they'll kill the offspring of other chimpanzees. And to me, the most alarming thing about a chimp is that if you have a group of 16 chimps in the jungle, they'll grow and they'll thrive till you have a group of about 30 or 32. They'll split into two groups, and then once enough time goes by, they'll go to war. And whichever side is stronger will kill off the members of the weaker side until once again you have 16 chimps in the jungle. And so this is a creature, the chimp, that is 99% identical to us and is like destined to war and kill each other. So this is where we got all our conceptions of, of humanity, that our best part about us is our culture that prevents us from being violent, and our animal side is the, is the, the dangerous side that we must avoid. And that is like deeply ingrained in us as a culture. And no one was talking about these bonobos because no one knew about them. There's only about 10,000 of them remaining. They live only in the center of Congo. Um, and it was, wasn't until the 1980s that any scientific studies were launched of bonobos. But once they were, we found out this creature is tied with the chimp as our closest relative, but they don't have any of those negative qualities that chimps have. So they don't murder each other, they're very peaceful, they're not patriarchal, they're matriarchal, so the females are in charge. Um, and when you have mothers in charge, they have a vested interest in making sure that no one's killing the, the infants. So they have this much more benevolent society. And so it's amazing, as a writer, you know, I'm sort of always on the lookout for things that thematically are, or metaphorically are really interesting. And so we have a tie, like basically the angel and the devil on our shoulder of these two creatures, one of whom found a way to be peaceful and one of whom is incredibly violent. Um, but the way it, the book I wrote before, Endangered, was uh, called The School for Dangerous Girls. It was about a boarding school for criminal young ladies. Um, and it's just totally a total left turn. And, what happened to me was, it was another bonobo. I, I'm really going for the cute ones in these pictures, but there's, I'll show some uglier ones later. Um, but I bought a pair of pants that were bonobo's brand. It's like a brand of khakis. I don't know if anyone's wearing any, um, but they arrived and the pants are fine. I don't get like paid product placement for putting those up on the slide. Um, but the pants came and I Googled it and I was like, where do they come up with this crazy name for pants? And I found all these YouTube videos of these bonobos. And you know how you can like lose a whole afternoon to YouTube videos? Like I was just clicking through on the right. Um, and so I just found out about this species of creature. And so I was curious enough to want to read more. So I read a, a account by a primatologist named Vanessa Woods. And it was about her time staying at the same sanctuary in Congo where I showed you that video with the baby apes. Uh, and it's basically an orphanage. So because of the bushmeat trade that's happening in the east of Congo, these orphans will show up for sale in marketplaces and they're raised with human mothers. Um, so they get bonded with uh, a human and they come to see that they have someone caring for themselves and they shake off their depression and start to want to live again and they, they thrive and then they're brought back out into the jungle once they're healthy. 
Um, and it was a really inspiring story. And there was one moment where she was on basically a ride along with the sanctuary employees. They were going to confiscate a baby ape that was being held at a bar as a way to bring in customers. And when they went to take the ape, the, the owner said, I won't give you it. You can give me $50 if you want it, but I'm, I'm not going to give you this for free. And she had the money, but she knew she couldn't buy an endangered animal because she would be encouraging the trade in those creatures, would be telling whoever hunted that bonobo's parents, they can go out and hunt another infant and get $50 for it. And the average income in Congo is $12 a month. $50 is enough to keep a family fed. You know, people are making difficult decisions, like they don't want to hunt endangered animals, but with the, with the poverty that came along with war in the East, there's tough choices being made. So anyway, she met, didn't rescue the ape. They came back with the police. The bar owner had gotten worried he was going to get in trouble, and he just got rid of this little bonobo, and they didn't get to save it. And so I'm writing in this young adult mode, and I'm thinking about what would I have done when I was 13, that me who cared too much about his gelled hair in that first picture. Um, and I think I would have made the other choice. I would have said, I could buy this creature and save it, and I could figure out later on how to stop the trade in these animals, but it needs saving and it, it will die if I don't. So that was the, the heart of Endangered, that uh, book that began this ape quartet, was imagining the other choice. So Vanessa Woods took the long-term view and the mature decision not to buy an endangered animal, and the animal probably died. Um, Sophie, in chapter one of Endangered, makes the other choice. And I think my writer technique I turn to over and over is, in chapter one, have the main character make a really crucial choice that defines who they are. Because when a character makes a choice in front of you, you know who they are much better than a long paragraph of beautiful language describing their internal state. Like, you know Sophie now, that she's a little impetuous, that she knows what she should be doing, but she's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save this creature. And the rest of the novel is working through the repercussions of it. Um, for me, the next thing that happened is I adopted a bonobo, not literally, no one should own apes. Uh, they would be a really cool pet, but they would break everything you own and maybe hurt your neighbors and get you arrested. Um, so you do not want to own an ape or a monkey, but I financially adopted Boyoma here at the sanctuary in Congo. And um, they give you a little description of your ape with a picture, and I don't know how he got a lollipop, but he's enjoying it. Um, but his description just said he was a rascal. And then I found out what that meant. They don't expect you to go to Congo and meet your ape, but because I was writing Endangered, I met Boyoma. And um, he's just a jerk. Like, he's like the worst behaved bonobo you've ever met. Like, the other ones are just like sort of politely just eating their breakfast, and he'll go like, oh, pap, and then like run off. And so he's, he's, he's finding it hard to make friends, and he's, he's really having a rough time. And, um, but I, I still love him, so. Um, and then I just wanted to show you a short video here of the, uh, the surrogate mothers and their young bonobos. Um, and what struck me the most learning about these apes was their emotional side. And I think we do a great job in our communicating with young people about the facts about animals and apes, but the, nothing can work quite like fiction can at forging an emotional connection. And it was really hard in my research before going to the sanctuary to actually see the incredible range of personalities that these apes had. Um, so as you can see from those videos, like some of them are rambunctious and causing trouble, others are shy and just want to hang out with their surrogate mother. It's the same range of personalities you find in, in human children. And I think, you know, telling stories in a believable way about animals is a way to prove to kids 
what might bond us with the natural world in a way that facts and, and encyclopedia articles can't. Um, this is Sake, who's one of the adults. I would spend a lot of my research time with her uh, because I would sit on one side of this electric fence and just take notes on the apes. And wherever she was, she would come over and she would sit on the other side of the fence and watch me. And I could tell she was thinking, like, why is this hairless ape taking notes about us? Like, what is he doing? Um, but she was never wanted me to know she was paying attention to me, so I would feel her eyes on me while I was taking notes, and then I would look over at her, and she would look off into the distance, and <laughs> then I would go back to taking notes, and she'd be looking at me again, I'd look over, and she would look off, and we would do this all afternoon. Um, so she was, like, had her own sort of temperament and became one of the characters in the book, and I knew I could take all the apes I met and put them into Endangered because they weren't going to sue me for slander or libel, right? Like, they weren't going to read it. I was, I was pretty safe. But this is the most foundational one. His name is Oshwe. Um, and he is, let's see if there's a place now. He's just about one year old here. And we would have breakfast on that bench every day because he was so young and scrawny and had had such a tough journey that if he ate with the other bonobos, they would get all the food first and he would just be on his own and it would all be gone. So that little green basket in the back would arrive full of food and he would just plow through and, um, and eat it as, as fast as he could. But the, he was, when I was blowing on his lips, he was like, kind of like going in for a kiss. Like he would have really loved to have like a, a full on kiss in that moment. And it's the thing about bonobos that I just sort of like dance around in Endangered, which is a YA novel. Um, bonobos are really, their society is structured around sexual activity and like of all kinds between all, all sexes, between young and old as, as groups and individuals. And um, they are like bonded by it. And what, physical interaction does is it produces oxytocin, which is this bonding hormone that forms uh, uh, an alliance with whoever you're, you are physically touching. And so the reason they have this more peaceful society is through their, their willingness to engage in constant sexual activity. Um, and as one of the, uh, the ape scholars, Franz de Waal, calls it, uh, chimpanzees resolve sexual issues through power, and bonobos resolve power issues through sex. Um, and it is really fascinating to see in there. Um, but in order to make sure that the book was also adopted by school systems and in school libraries, um, there's a lot of presenting and grooming and, and rubbing, <laughs> but I don't really call a spade a spade necessarily in order to like, actually get it into kids' hands. And when you're, when you're with bonobos, you realize sex for a bonobo is very different. It's not nearly as freighted as it is for a homo sapien. Like, it's like, they, they call it the bonobo handshake. You know, they'll just like, a few seconds of just a quick, a quick rub and then they go on with their day. It's just a reminder that, that, you're, that they're connected. And research now is showing oxytocin exists in all, almost all of animalia except for the jellyfish. So even ants produce oxytocin, this bonding hormone, uh, when they are interacting with each other. But it was really inspiring for me as a writer to see that they don't have any shame around their sexual lives and that they are all inherently bisexual. And this is our closest relative in the animal kingdom. Um, and it's what's led to uh, a book I have coming up in May, um, a nonfiction work about the huge burst in research in the last 20 years into animal sexuality and ways in which it is not this kind of Noah's Ark heteronormative version that we were all brought up with, that there's a real diversity to gender identity, a sexual identity, and sexual behavior in, in animals. So that's, that's coming up in, in May as well. But one thing I've, I've also learned is that animal comparisons are different depending on who's hearing it. Um, and I think, you know, I know that I'm a little unusual in my consideration of animals um, because most of my writing life has been spent writing about animals in a whole bunch of different ways. We have this fox and a rooster who are uh, operating a rescue agency to help animals that are in trouble around the world or like Endangered, which is a much more realistic story. But as I visited schools for my books, I've learned that how I think about animals is outside of the mainstream. I often get asked by teachers, not by kids, whether my books are arguing that animal lives are more important than human lives. And I've always been a little baffled by that question. I've never said such a thing. I've just said that I thought animal lives were worth caring about, and that we should seriously consider modifying our behavior when that behavior does harm to them. But the question I got had an assumption behind it, that which is that care given to animals means less care le left over for humans, that it is therefore somehow immoral. And I spent a long time thinking about that, and I was wrestling with that issue early on. And I really emphatically disagree with that assumption. I don't think caring is a limited resource, and I think the sum of care in the world can be increased. 
In fact, I think care for animals leads to greater care for humans too, since we all share the natural world, and the same systems of power that endanger animals also endanger humans. I do think animals are deserving of significant moral consideration, and I hope that 100 years from now we'll look back at our current practices in horror. This is the number of land animals that are raised and killed for food in really terrible conditions here, right in the US. That's 10 billion. Um, and it's, we have ag-gag laws preventing cameras from even going inside. And sea creatures, it gets way even higher, right? This is the industrial number killed by industrial fishing. Um, that's one to three trillion. And I'll admit that I'm sloppy in this conviction as well. I don't always act in ways that give animals equal moral consideration. In other words, I love cheese. <laughs> But I know that other people live their lives with more consistency around animals and I admire them greatly for, for doing that. And I, I, bring this, I bring these things up because I know being compared to animals or like talking about the linkage between us and animals is loaded, particularly for people who have already been mockingly compared to an animal on the basis of their race or sexuality or gender expression. And I want you to know that I don't intend any negative value judgment in comparing humans to animals. In fact, I consider these links sources of comfort and wonder. Um, this is the third book in the Ape, Ape Quartet, uh, which took me to Sumatra to spend time with some orangutans. And um, there, there was one moment I was at this orangutan rescue, and I was feeding melon to these orangutans. Um, and I had four pieces of melon, and there were five orangutans in this enclosure. And orangutans are really different than bonobos and chimps. We're only about 93% related to this animal, um, so it's it's harder to read expressions um, that are similar to humans. And I was giving out this melon to the, to the orangutans and I had to skip the last one and she looked like she didn't care in the world. And then 40 minutes later, I, was, I walked around the enclosure and I passed by again and I heard and she just spat on my neck. Like she just like was preparing her revenge and then she like spat on me to punish me for it. Um, and it was such an amazing like, and, and her face was totally expressionless because they live solitary lives, they, don't, they haven't involved the need to show their emotions on their faces, so they're much harder to read. Um, but it was amazing to be in Indonesia and see monkeys are literally everywhere, like the actual animal is everywhere. They're also everywhere in the iconography of Indonesia. They're on the friezes of temples. You find, you know, no surface, if it could have a monkey on it, won't have some sort of depiction of a monkey. And it made me realize how much we are lacking in our Western society in access to non-human primates. Like, when we were evolving the three religions, the Abrahamic religions that, you know, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, like the nearest animal we had was like a deer, right? So you'd look at these animals and think like, oh yeah, humans really are very special. So we have this like sort of idea that we are a creature unique on the world. Um, whereas Hinduism and Buddhism, which came to be in places like Indonesia with non-human primates, not coincidentally have this worldview where we are in interconnected in a web and being a human isn't, structurally different than being a non-human animal. It's just a difference of, um, of degree. And this is the, uh, I think, you know, this is one of the quotes I love from Vesper Flights, which is a new uh, book of nonfiction by Helen MacDonald. She says, uh, it's not that creatures work as models for human lives. No one I know thinks that humans should spawn like wave-borne fish or subsist entirely on flies. But the more I've learned about animals, the more I've come to think that there might not be one right way to express care, to feel allegiance, a love of place, a way of moving through the world. And I think one of the people that was inspiring to me in my research in thinking about animals was um, Jane Goodall, uh, who in the 60s really revolutionized primate science and all of science by going into Tanzania and instead of numbering her chimpanzee subjects the way that scientists are supposed to, she named them. Um, and she gave them names like Frodo, because she was into the Lord of the Rings. Um, and she was able to follow their societies um, by actually seeing them as, as persons that had their own desires and drives. And she was ridiculed in the scientific academy for giving her subjects names like Frodo and Fifi. But she credits that naming with allowing her to see them as individuals with their own drives and desires and therefore to, enjoy, to observe a greater range of behaviors within them. And one of her chimpanzees, Flo, was in two of her books and became so beloved by the reading public in uh, England and around the world that she's actually the only non-human ever to receive an obituary in the Sunday Times. Um, and she has these ragged ears. Um, she's a grandmother many times over. 
And my favorite little tidbit in, in Goodall's writings is that she was also the one that all the, all the guys were into. Like, of any age, like, she was the most popular one. Um, and they were just, they saw something in flow that they were very excited about. But this human exceptionalism that we've inherited, it's not our fault that we feel like we are special as humans. Like, it is deeply ingrained in our culture here in the, in the West. It tells us that the land and its inhabitants were placed here for us to use, that they are property and natural resources rather than beings with internal lives and identities. It allows for hunting without consuming what's hunted, and it allows like pricking a bull, making him charge to prove how brave the Toreador is, and then slaying the bull. And although it's still going strong, it has taken some big hits since the days of Genesis, but the biggest was maybe when Charles Darwin published his theory of evolution by natural selection, which compellingly argued that humans and apes share a common ancestor. It's hard to overstate how shocking that would have been to a world that truly saw humans as something essentially separate from the rest of creation. Humans can't be related to animals. We have souls. Like, we were created on an entirely different day. And Darwin's science showed that humans share their family tree with animals, and that therefore the creatures around us are relatives, not objects for us to use, as will, use at will. That we are different by kind, uh, not by kind, but by degree. This led to the last book in the Ape Quartet, and then I, I will open it up for, for questions in a moment. Um, but with Endangered, the one I described right in the beginning, we have a young human, uh, Sophie, who's 13 going on 14, who adopts a baby ape. With the last book in the quartet about gorillas, I swapped that plot line. So I imagined a gorilla who winds up adopting a baby human. Like to think about how, how might a gorilla um, uh, care for one of us that had need of it. Um, and that came to be because when I was doing my research into gorillas, preparing to write this work, um, it, I realized, it revealed to me that gorillas used to live in a, by the millions across Central Africa. They were one of the dominant creatures. This is a million years ago. Um, and what happened is the, a series of volcanic explosions happened and formed the Great Rift Valley, which allowed humans for the first time to come down into that part of Africa. And so you had these early humans, 600,000 years ago, meeting gorillas. And at the time, like if you looked at it just through a camera lens, it would not have seemed likely that we would now be in the position that we are. I mean, a human is sort of scrawny, like our skin breaks really easily, our teeth are pathetic, and this gorilla is like this hulking animal. Like, of course, they should totally tromp us and they would be the ones to survive, but obviously it's not, it didn't work out that way. But it, it's stuck in my mind, this idea that at some point it happened. I don't know where and I don't know how, but the first time a gorilla met a human. And in that moment, the beginning of where we are now, this Anthropocene epic that where humans are dominant, started. And I was imagining this moment, like what if we were the ones that needed care and like it, it could have gone differently. So I wrote this book from a gorilla's point of view um, and I wrote it all in two months in just normal prose, and I gave it to my editor. Uh, and he said, you know what, we have to have lunch. And I know when my editor wants to have lunch with me, it's bad news. Um, and we had lunch and he said, you know what, I just, paragraphs and sentences for this gorilla just don't make sense. Like, I don't feel like I'm in her mind. And would you consider changing it into verse? Um, and so I ended up changing it into a verse novel, which I didn't self-identify as a poet, but it was a way to have white space on the lines to break up the language, to be more impressionistic, and also to skip all the inter interconnective tissue. Like, I skipped all the scenes that weren't essential and just had these sort of poems that move through this gorilla's life as she adopts this um, orphaned human. Um, and it took the book from being 80,000 words to 20,000 words. And it, I realized, like, it made me now, I write slimmer books because I'm, I'm like, oh, you, you actually don't need those other 60,000 words, and I'm sorry, previous readers, for always, uh, for always <laughs> putting them in. But I think, you know, I, I just want to conclude by, by saying that without making a conscious decision to, we spend most of our intellectual history as a species working hard to identify what makes us special and what distinguishes us and how we are separate from the natural world. Just think about how easily we say we're going into nature on a weekend trip as though our apartment, our home, isn't also part of nature. Or how an average movie will talk about the hero saving the world and what that really means is saving human civilization. Like they're one and the same to our, our consciousness. And to think about humans differently, to strip away our lonely status as above the rest of the animal kingdom, it means ruffling feathers, it's uncomfortable. 
It requires consciously giving up some of the power we've artificially granted ourselves by saying that we were the only ones created in God's image. But it just might be the key to creating a new generation that is invested in its destiny amid nature, not above it. It requires working against centuries of human exceptionalism. It's been nice to be exceptional. It comes along with a lot of great perks. Like we get to beautiful buildings like this. But sometimes we have to toss aside something that gives us power in the name of pursuing compassion and justice. And what naysayers have called nature's intention is just how centuries of humans have decided the natural order ought to be. There's no need to keep traditions that hurt or exclude anyone, including non-humans. After all, traditions are just peer pressure from dead people, and we get to make new ones of our own. So what if our literature for young people and for old people could begin to focus not on what makes humans exceptional, but on what bonds us with the natural world? What if that didn't feel like a loss, but like a relief? Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, what we'll do is we'll start with maybe two questions on scene and then open the floor to questions. Okay, and questions also from our remote audience. How do you protect yourself from making yourself vulnerable? Right, thinking about these topics and writing about you know our relation to animals and our sort of broken kinship with the natural world which like the more you think about it the more it hurts and it sort of and you're asking your audience to be also vulnerable mm. and to how do you deal with this yeah um how do you it's like it's very easy to like sort of keep the curtain closed right like uh -huh. not have to like just get through your day to day and we learn not to think about the things that are upsetting you know um and i used to you know if i was reading the newspaper and i saw an article about you know, the, the war in Congo or about endangered animals dying, like, I would just kind of skip, skip the article because I knew I wouldn't fully understand what was going on. I wouldn't be able to do anything and mm -hmm. just move on to, you know, celebrity pages or something. But um, it's, I think especially when writing for young people, like, you have to, A, be honest because they crave honesty, um, but B, also provide pathways, uh, other emotional experiences as part of it, you know, so, like, humor or um, having a really exciting story um, and a sense of hope, you know, that, that there's, there are things to do and, and ways to help. Um, and I think, I think it would be really bleak writing these books for adults because I think I would probably lean really heavily into that, the, the grim part. Um, and instead, I'm thinking like, how does this reader's experience help them understand the world and leave them more capable to, to, to help? So do you think that anthropomorphism helps? Like, what's your take on anthropomorphizing? There's a big discussion around which modes of writing, more on the realistic side versus on the fantasy side, which, which have the affordances to engage the audience in, in productive ways, thinking about these questions? Yeah. Well, there was... You know, one of the things I love in the last few years is um, Franz de Waal, the primatologist, has come up with this concept of anthropodenial. So, like, anthropomorphism has no opposite, right? So, anthropomorphism is assigning human qualities to non-human animals. We don't have a word for investing animals with human feelings, or if we do, they're loaded, like, pathetic fallacy. They're loaded yeah. with this judgment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and anthropodenial is, like, identifying Here's like, we are, we, are, we are preventing even believing that animals have feelings. Um, and if we, if we decide that is true, then all is permitted. Like we have no responsibility towards them. Uh, and I think that is really dangerous and, and, and causes great harm. And it's also kind of the structure of our scientific establishment. You know, like anthropomorphism is an accusation lobbied at scientists for accusing them of bad science, right? That they are. Like, like Jane Goodall, right? Caring too much. Yeah, that she's fallen in love with these chimpanzees and she's no longer seeing them you know, as, as, um, as animals when they're, that's, that's their proper state. They are these things. Uh, and I think just to say that it's a really convenient trick to say that ever, ever thinking like an animal has a sensory experience is bad science. Is it allows all science to be permitted without a consideration of ethics, which I think is kind of a mean way to do science. Very mean, indeed. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, let's open it to questions from the audience. 
We also have quite a few questions uh, virtually as well, so I can throw it over to Nick. Elliot, we have a question from Alexa, and Alexa would like to know, do you have a favorite moment while researching with the bonobos that had a big impact on you and your writing? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, there was one of these infant apes, um, her name was Kindu, she was the smallest one. She wasn't in that video that you saw, um, but she was what we would call a biter uh, in humans. Like she just really wanted to get her teeth into me. Like, and I, she didn't want to hurt me exactly, but I would just like look over and she'd be like, you know, <laughs> like, like running over. And so whenever, um, whenever she was near, I'd sort of like, you know, sort of like fend her off. Like the other ones were cute. She was not cute. She was out doing her own thing. Um, and one time I got distracted because the apes just love to play King of the Mountain, as you can see from that video. So like, I just had apes literally covering my face, like I couldn't even see anything else. And I got distracted and I just felt this like bright pain on my leg. I looked down and she's just, she got it. Like she just planted her <laughs> teeth in my leg and just chowed down. Um, and her surrogate mother pulled her off of me, but I saw later that she had, she had broken the skin, she had drawn blood. And so I went, uh, I got my phone out, and I occasionally, this is the, the middle of DRC, but I had one bar of signal if I was in one part of the sanctuary. And so I called my doctor in the US, and I told him, like, I got bitten by an endangered ape in Congo, what should I do? <laughs> and he was like, can I put you on hold? <laughs> and then he came, came back like a minute or two later, and he said, all I can say is you, you wash it out with soap and water, like that's all, all we got. So that's all I did. And um, so far, so good. But like, if I caused the pandemic, I'm sorry. Like, I don't know. This is back in 2012, so I think I think we're good. <laughs> but that was really foundational, and and also like, Kindu just being Kindu was like, you know, my goal was to bring out the emotional sides of these creatures, and like that was just such a like, I know that kid. This kid happens to be a bonobo, but I know that kid. So it was like I was, it was, it was great because we if we make them all saccharine like these wonderful creatures that just want to cuddle and they're adorable and they're amazing. Like, young people don't fully buy it, right? They're, they're told that all of, all of animals are just, you know, wonderful creatures waiting for us to like, tend to them and love them. And sometimes animals can be jerks. Like, yeah. and Kindu was like, that was, that was painful. And I still have a scar, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that was an important part to making it believable, I think. I would like to ask um, from your perspective as an author, when you write for young adult, do you consider the human cognitive development, or you just write? Do you just like um, sort the values that you want to deliver in your book, or you just you believe that humans are not never too young to learn about anything? Oh yeah. So do I do I hold okay. back in certain topics based on the age of who I'm writing for? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. It's something I wrestle with for each book. Like, and I think. It is, I mean, it's tempting to say young people can take anything, like they are, they are, they're ready for it. But I also know, like, young people can be traumatized, you know, by reading something that they're not ready for. And it's, it's if it's treated in a way that they have either difficulty accessing or, or it, it, they, don't, they can't understand enough of it to sort of get through and get somewhere positive at the end of it, that it can be dangerous to, to give it to a child. So I do think about, um, the way I'm telling stories, depending on the age. Um, and I think this ape quartet is, is unusual because usually our animal stories tend to be for younger readers, right? So once we're in YA, it's like humans having human stories and we, the animal stories kind of drop out. And I think, and once we get to adults, adult literature, like we have very few stories that feature animals as main characters. Um, and I think, I, I see why most of our books are about adults, but sometimes I look at the shelf and I'm like, all of our books are about people. Like, mm. like we do have good stories, but we're not the only stories happening, right? Like, other creatures are having pretty fascinating stories that we might want to read about. So um, I do tend to kind of push animals into older age groups, but when I'm writing for really young readers, like the Animal Rescue Agency, you know, it's a fox and a rooster having, you know, funny banter and rescuing an animal that we all know is going to be fine in the end. And, um, for some kids, like that is that is enough danger. Like that is just the right spot. So, just providing those resources. Great question. 
Elliot, we have a question from Brian, and Brian would like to know, what recommendations of books or other literature do you have for young audiences, like the three to six-year-old range, to help them appreciate the non-anthropomorphic, non-human world? Oh, yeah, oh, we actually have a picture book expert here, Phyllis Root. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, Phyllis, but Phyllis is an amazing author of picture books for young people. Um, what are your go-tos on empathetic books for young people? <laughs> could, you, could you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, so books for three to six-year-olds that would foster a, a feeling of responsibility towards the natural world. For the natural world, not just animals. I think, I mean, I think any good nonfiction will do that. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of books that are out or coming out, like I think of Jackie Briggs Martin's Creek Finding, mm -hmm. you know, which is about finding this buried creek and restoring the world. Um, boy, I, I can't come up with titles. I wasn't really prepared. <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was not, not really fair of me. Yeah. But, but I do think that um, picture books, respecting the natural world, and also I would say um, instilling not just respect, but a sense of wonder. Do you know, um, I was working with Jackie and with uh, Liza Ketchum on this book that we wrote about the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, and it wasn't until we, we literally came to the line and discovered that this was a really important line, and there's the wonder. So I think any time you can put that into a book for children. And then what you said, honesty. You know, not, not, um, not giving into the urge to anthropomorphize or to make things cute or something like that. I mean, there's so much amazing, so many amazing things about the world, <laughs> you know? Um, and children are just, in love with it all and fascinated by it all. So I know that's not really a very specific answer, um, but I'm going to give them. Thanks, Phyllis. So, Elliot, um, I teach here at the university, and I've been teaching for over 20 years now. And I really I resonate with so much of what you say. And I also know it's really hard to get students to be able to interact with nature. Uh, even the Mississippi River. I mean, we're so fortunate to be right there. But to get them along or even in the river, let alone interact with animals. I, I, I think we're moving in the opposite direction, and it's, it's very sobering to me to, um, to try to, you know, as someone who's trying really hard to do that. Um, and I think students really want that too but they've also been conditioned away from that through K through 12, et cetera, unless they have good teachers or good programs. I know you teach at Hamlin, but I, I would like to just hear what, <laughs> well, I don't know, will you solve this, please? Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Can thank I solve you. it for you? Yes. No problem, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's easy. <laughs> well, I, I think, um, I, I certainly have, feel this way, but like, it feels like all the, the good nature is like, curated somewhere that you should go to and go watch it, right? Like, if you really want to have a natural experience, you should, you know, go do chimpanzee trekking in Uganda and, like, stuff around here. It's not, you're not getting the full experience. It's sort of the way that which, you know, our curated algorithms for our feed, right? Like, the best posts are the one that you're going to get. And I, one thing I love is there's an English teacher uh, in New Jersey, Sarah Mulhern Gross, who teaches at the high-tech high school in, in Jersey. And she has her students go out and sit in a square yard of grass, just in the field at the school, and just observe in, in their notebook, observe what's there. And she makes them sit there for what feels to them a, like enormous time. I think it's, it's probably 20 minutes, but I think, I think it, like, be, after the first minute, they're like, there's not, I'm, I'm in grass, there's nothing here, you know? And then all of a sudden, by the end of this period, they're noting like the crumbly soil in one area and it's more moist than another one. There's aphids on some of the grass, but not, the, not this other species of grass there that doesn't have aphids on it. And it's just the field at the school that they've walked through so many times. And 
I think that's, it's a great exercise to, to not think, to sit here and observe here and know that you're part of it and it's natural wherever it is. <laughs> like, that you don't have to go elsewhere and therefore you're on hiatus from being part of the natural world until you get to that place. And I think it's sort of this intentionality and like being in the moment, right? But I, I, I try to, it's hard, but I try to cultivate it. And it's even simple things like sort of waiting for the bus and like realizing I'd reached my phone and like, okay, I'm gonna wait for this bus without, <laughs> without the phone. Mm. It's hard, right? Mm. But it's that being able to observe the world around us is sort of the root of it. I didn't solve it at all for you and I'm sorry. <laughs> Elliot, we have a question from John, and John would like to know, how do you feel about the fact that Dungeons and Dragons has made a comeback? <laughs> have role-playing games helped shape the way you write? That's an awesome question. Um, I, I, I assume you liked the, the player's handbook being up on the slideshow, John. Um, I, uh, I, am, I just actually just read in the last few days that it's been making a comeback. I kind of assumed it was on a slow decline and that I shouldn't make Dungeons and Dragons references, but man, no, it is having a heyday. And um, I think, you know, just thinking back to that 13-year-old like, kid that was in that slide, that 13-year-old me, like, socializing is hard. Like, and it, it took, you know, 30 years later, now I can like pretty much do it, but it's kind of exhausting after a few hours of socializing. And Dungeons and Dragons is like a structured activity where like, you get to all hang out and do this thing together and be together and there's a mission and that you don't have to figure out the new thing to say about the weather that is boring otherwise, right? Um, it's a, it's a, it's, it counts as that oxytocin bonding, like it's an activity that you're spending together. Like you don't have to be plumbing the depths of your heart to be getting closer to your friends. So I think that's maybe why it's so important now because it's something that we do together. We don't it's, it's kind of the opposite of a lot of the, the social media that's pulling us into isolation. So you recently wrote a science fiction novel, which is very good. Um, and in thinking about using science to inform literature and creativity, and knowing that we're on kind of the crest of this big climate change thing that we're, gonna, we're all gonna hit, and in being responsible to a young reader, knowing that they're going to inherit this world that is going to look very different, how do you not write a depressing, <laughs> dystopic novel and end with hope and be like, these things are going to happen. It's no longer science fiction, it's just science. It's going to happen. We need to be dressing it in literature for young people, but we also need to give them hope at the end of that. How do you yeah. see that working and balancing? Yeah. That's a great question, Andrea. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I, I think, so sometimes it is the like ending on a message of hope like you described. I think, especially with younger readers, I, I do come back to that as key. Um, but the more important thing, I think none of us want to be scolded and, and lectured in a experience. Like that might, you might learn things as you go, but you want to have not the feeling that you are you are benighted and some author knows more than you and they're telling you like here's the terrible things you should be paying attention to so um, I do think about you know just giving as much pleasure as I can uh, in the book to, to go along with anything else that I'm exploring and to just raise questions to not like make statements um, but Darkness Outside Us you know takes place 400 years in the future and it's two boys on a spaceship trying to figure out the mystery of why they're on this ship basically um, and it was a way to imagine what would Earth look like in 400 years? Um, which was actually kind of fun, you know? Like, I, was, I, I, I think, like, it, it's really hard to imagine now a sort of land war the way that war worked in the early 20th century, that it's like cyber attacks and economic warfare and like, just seeing it like that to the nth degree. So like their society is not even two countries that are, there's only two countries left, but they're not even geographically separated. They're just economic entities within each other. And, and there's a corporation that's more powerful than either country. And, it was just a way to, like, like, none of that is making a statement about the way the world is now, but it's all exploring issues that we're going through in it. And this is something I love about science fiction is, like, it takes what's true here and then it recontextualizes it so you can see it all over again in a new context. Um, and my favorite science fiction has always done that, that, like, oh, I sort of, like, it's just another angle to, to look at things. Um, and so 
that was something I, would, I kept in mind when darkness outside is. Uh, Nick, do we have maybe one last question and then we'll move on to book signing? Yes, Pamela uh, just asked, is there a way to add hope um, in such a way as to arm our children with the ability to accept change and to work with it? Yeah, like um, resilience. <laughs> I mean, you've been wrestling with talking about climate for young people and books that have done it. Like, it's sort of your, do you have any thoughts around how to keep kids hopeful? I wish. I mean, I know there is a lot of experimentation going on. And, and I do also have a sense, like you mentioned in your talk, that, you know, we are only now waking up to the reality and necessity of dealing with these hundreds and hundreds of years of legacy of human supremacy. Like, how do you undo it? Like, and we want to undo it now, within a year, within the next five years or something. So similarly, I think with the, you know, the, to conceptualize these complex challenges around climate change, biodiversity loss, it's like one thing, one mega challenge. And then another is, okay, if and when you start thinking about it, what are the paths where you can be inspired to do something, to, so, to be hopeful? And, and I know that, like, so I've been looking at uh, all kinds of literature, like how do authors do it actually in the stories? And there is, very different kinds of hope in your different books. There are books where authors would use uh, not only animals, but the planet actually talking to uh, human characters. Um, so there is a range of literary strategies that authors are experimenting with um, that are very hopeful, but we are only at the beginning of this journey. And whereas we've had at least three decades of very strong dystopian tradition. Mm. So the, the first knee-jerk reaction to talk about climate change has been, okay, let's do dystopia. Let's imagine this horrible world, how much worse it can get 10, 20, 50 years from now. So I, I haven't read dark, The Darkness Outside Us, but I, my sense is that some of the things you do in this work is to project a future which is not necessarily worse that or dystopian compared to our present. It's like even creating this kind of opening is in itself a, a, an operation of hope. Mm. But I guess I, I, it's, it's not really like an answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, there's no easy answer for that one, right? Like building yeah. resilience in young people. But something I do keep in mind, especially when writing about animals, is that you know, often the first question I get from an audience is like, does the animal die at the end? Like, <laughs> No one wants to read that book. Like we've all been brutalized by those books, mm -hmm. right? Like where the red fern grows and old yellow. Mm -hmm. and, sorry, <laughs> fans out there. Um, and so I keep that in mind. Like my job is not to like make you really unhappy by the end. So like the animals don't die at the end of my books, you know? Like not to spoiler it, but I think it's part of that building wonder, right? So you have this emotional connection with characters. Some of them are non-human, but you're also connected with them, and it was really cool, and you had a fun time. And at the end of the book, I, I usually include like a, a page of further resources, like four articles that are kid-friendly, kid-facing, that they could read to get more information. And I think most readers will not follow, and then there might be like a small percentage of young readers who are, their, their lives are wide open, what they're gonna do with them, right? And so some of that further reading and exploration will create the next generation of people working to help. So, yeah. Thank you um, so much. It's thank really, you. Yeah. Thank you, thank everyone, you, everyone, and thank you, our remote audience. Uh, we will now have Elliot signing books at the back of the room. So um, thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, and uh, I hope to see you next year at our next book week. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. Thanks. It's been wonderful.